place in our hearts. And uh, we're so grateful for the, the opportunities and uh, for your prayers and uh, for the things, for the encouragement that you've given us over our time that we've been able to know you. Um, we're leaving in just under three weeks now uh, to Chicago. Uh, two weeks ago, we were able to find a place to live. And uh, as Brother Ritter so graciously reminded me this morning, it's, it's not about us. Um, it's about those who we are going to go and serve. Um, from the front steps of our apartment building, um, we were amazed at just how many families were walking by in full Muslim garb, um, women in full burqas, uh, men in their, their head coverings and um, the dress that they wear. Uh, there are just so many opportunities. We're thankful that God has put us uh, in the right place in the heart of this neighborhood northern Chicago, and uh, it's our task to go serve Him. Uh, the purpose of our mission is to, to glorify God and to try and build a disciple-making movement by working through various churches and organizations uh, around Chicago, the Chicagoland area, uh, basically to have gospel conversations with whomever we meet. God gives us in our path, and that we may be able to share the love of Christ through hospitality, mercy ministry, um, inviting people into our home, um, and just being good citizens and uh, people of God. May God shine the light, His glory. Father in heaven, in the name of your son, Jesus, we thank you for being in this place. And Father, you sent Sean and Sonny along, not 
just as a preacher, but as a man with a true heart for your gospel and a heart for this congregation when we were at our lowest point. And Lord, we pray now as they go to Chicago that you would bless them with every blessing in heaven above and on earth here below. That you would keep them constantly and keep your angels round about them. And Lord, glorify your name through their work in the Muslim community in Chicago. And we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus and all God's children said. Amen. Amen. Ah, the Beatitudes. What is it that God does when he blesses someone? We've seen that the Beatitudes are not imposed. They are a reflection of the fact that God has come into relationship with his people. They are evidences of his work in their lives. And some of the evidences are not what the world outside would want from a blessing. But they are blessings nevertheless. We have seen they follow somewhat of chronological order, if you will, of the normal timeline of coming uh, to faith in Christ and growing in him. Uh, but, and they don't represent groups of people within the church. Certainly not some that are assigned to perpetual mourning while the rest of us uh, have other things to do. But they are uh, for all of us because they are God in our lives. And they are not phases, unfortunately, from some of our perspectives through which we may pass and then say, well, I got that one done. <laughs> they are parts of our lives at all times. And we've seen how even uh, the, the sorrow that brings us rightfully before the presence of Almighty God in salvation, uh, returns to us at times when we realize that we have drifted from him and we need to find our way back to the center of his love. So today we come to uh, the ninth verse, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Let's pray. Father. Instruct us together today, we pray. May we learn from you what you have for us in this. Amen. Just a note for anyone who cares. I don't really want to be on the stool for the rest of my life, but the last few days have been horrible. So continue to pray for your pastor, please. Um, although, as I said before, it was good enough for Christ. <laughs> who taught sitting down? I guess I shouldn't feel so bad about it. Ah, the peacemakers. I heard something said to me this week that I didn't imagine would ever be said to me. I think of it as a kind of a Hollywood thing. Someone actually said, Ralph, go to your special place. This was my PT person. Because she consistently is frustrated with the fact that I am by nature tense. And that is experienced in the muscles which she is trying to stretch and manipulate. And everything about me says, don't touch, don't move, let it alone. And so she said to me, oh, Ralph, go to your special place. Go to your happy place. I thought, well, it's worth a shot. I found <laughs> myself by a mountain lake. And before you know it, was all over. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's becoming harder and harder for all of us to go to a happy place, isn't it? If you, especially if you watch the news. These are frightening times. Uh, if we're not frightened for ourselves, we're frightened for those we love. And if we have an even more generous heart, we're just uh, frightened for those who live in the world's cities. And even as the brother was talking, I mean, we as Christians ought to be, I think we are by right, uh, given a great love for all people. Uh, but the enemy is certainly using evil to confuse us, to frighten us, 
and uh, we have to stand against the enemy. Because when God is present in the life of a believer, he makes us to be peacemakers. Now understand that for us, and even for the Hebrew word shalom, peace goes back and forth between a lot of different senses. Of course, even with shalom, it sometimes means a little more than hello, goodbye. Even in the time of Jesus, it had that tendency. But also, it meant peace. Sometimes it means peace and well-being. And refers to, to really a work of God in those who are receiving uh, The word peace runs through all of Scripture, and so I decided today, knowing that we were going to run along anyhow, uh, to uh, make an effort to pare down some of the things I might usually go over and try to focus on just a few thoughts because it's such a big one. But Irene, otherwise known to us as Irene, the Greek, uh, while it has a range of meaning, as all words do, more often than not, in Jesus' day, in the New Testament time, peace was little more than the opposite of war. It was, you know, you can have a state of war between yourself and, and your neighbor, <laughs> unfortunately, very urban thing, or you can have a, a state of war between two nations, and the opposite of that is to be at peace not to have those stressors, not to have those hostilities. And um, those that are blessed by God to be peacemakers are said in this verse to be called sons of God. And the reason is not hard to find. Because those who are peacemakers have a family resemblance. They look like the ultimate peacemaker. And uh, I want to look first of all at that. You can turn to 1160 in your pew Bible, if you would. And uh, we're going to look at, not in detail, but at, at length a little bit, at a passage there in Ephesians uh, chapter 3. Two, pardon me. Yeah. I wrote over my five, hoping it would look like a two, and when I looked down from up here, it looked like a three. What can I tell you? It's a two. Chapter two, verse eleven. Now I want you to listen carefully to this description of Christ, the peacemaker. It's talking to a predominantly Gentile church. Therefore, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time, oh, and this is so powerful, isn't it? separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, having no hope, and without God. Any believer looks back on that and remembers what their life was before the cross, that it cannot fail to be touched and moved by what God has done. Because that describes all of us so perfectly. No hope. No God. Well, some had false gods, but not a true God. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us, Jew and Gentile, both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Uh, just a note, because it's very personal to me, this is the struggle I have with Messianic Judaism. It's for building the wall that Christ sacrificed himself to do so. I struggle with that terribly. Terribly. But that's just me sharing with you. And I know there are other perspectives. 
He did this by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. And so he made peace. So making peace. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit in the Father. Now I'm going to come back to just that portion, but it would be wrong not to finish the thought. For through him we, uh, pardon me, verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you have our fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Are you stirred by that? I hope you are. What an agenda. <laughs> But remember this about being a peacemaker on the model of the peace. <coughs> what was the cost? We read in what we read three things that ought to be remembered at all times. The cost was his blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood, the giving of his life was what it cost him to make this peace possible. He did it in the flesh that he took on in his incarnation, suffering enormously in the flesh, and in my opinion, suffering even more deeply in the spirit through his separation from the Father. And where did he suffer? On the cross one of the many human dimensions of horrible, horrible torment and death. It requires sacrifice of self in service of others. The goal has to become more important than my comfort zone. I have to be willing to give it my all. Jesus himself said, take up your cross. The world says good fences make good neighbors. They have to be pretty doggone good fences <laughs> when you have certain kinds of neighbors. Some of them need to be acoustical. Some of them need to be very high. Some of them, one is tempted to even put barbed wire on. Oh, my pastor's a hateful man. No, I'm just saying, if you want peace that way, you're going to have to have a mighty good fence. And it will never keep your neighbor from picking up the phone and complaining about you to the authorities or whatever. No, what the Bible says is that good neighbors are made by good peacemakers. People who know how to bring down the wall that separates. Who needed this peace brought to them? I want you to notice that too. Both those who were far off and those who were near. Why? Because we're talking about something that is relational. The book I referenced earlier, that was the power of that book to me, it was talking about uh, how gender is a reflection of the image of God and man but he was consistently bringing forth the fact that because of that, gender is exhibited most where there is a relationship. It is not out there in an amorphous, ambiguous way. Gender is for relationship. Everything in us, one could easily make a case, that is the image of God in us is relational. Why? Because God is relational. 
He is a trinity. He is one God in three persons, existing sublimely in fellowship one with the other from all eternity. And if you doubt the significance of that, read as I'm always encouraging you to do at least once a month. Brother Sean, read this once a month. John 17. Nowhere do you get a closer appropriation of the very heart of Christ. And what he asked the Father to do in that chapter is to bring us into the very fellowship that he left behind for us. That's amazing. Only he could want that. Only he could do that. But it's always about relationships. So when we make peace, it's not so that we can have peace. Do you understand that? Sometimes we're willing to make peace if the problem would just go away. We're talking about making peace so that we can be in a relationship with someone because they are now in a relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the only real relationship that lasts are between those who are already in relationship with Jesus Christ. He came to bring us into relationship with God. He leaves us to call others into relationship with God. And in that relationship, peace is found. We who were once enemies, when God demonstrated his love toward us, are now at the end of the battle. The prayer of faith is a statement of surrender, or it's not really. Uh, the uh, mission of the church, the call on us to be peacemakers, is something I want to spend just a little time emphasizing as well. So if you go to page 1148, if I can read my own writing, which my wife can tell you. That should put you in 2 Corinthians and uh, chapter 5. One of my favorite passages. Uh, but this is what Paul has to say. And it's very germane to the Great Commission without repeating those exact words. And it's very germane to what it is to be a peacemaker. So I want you to listen carefully as we read. Beginning at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, relationship, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ Reconcile. That is but another word for what we're talking about. To be reconciled is to be at peace in the relationship. He reconciled us, first of all, to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them. You want to be a peacemaker? Don't keep a list of offenses. That's God's job anyhow. Right? That is the job for the judge of all the world. Don't keep a list of offenses. You'll never get the job done. And entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The, the common phrase of days gone by, make your peace with God, is now kind of mocked. But that scripture, make your peace with God, is the message we bring. God wants a relationship and he will have it. You need to surrender with to him. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And here we revisit the whole thing from another perspective, don't we? But sacrifice brings reconciliation, but more than that, and it's a subtle thing, and I won't dwell on it because some of you are exposed to this conversation, so I don't want to open it all up here. But uh, while there are many benefits to the thinking surrounding the missional church, there are also many problems. The missional church is desiring to reach, reach the world by finding a way to present myself to the world in a way that they will find acceptable and therefore listen to me. Only a, that's my daughter would say. Only a, that's not what the scripture says. My job is to say to the unsaved, you need to be reconciled to God. And there's no buffering of that message. It's done. There's no way to do that because we are ambassadors. And an ambassador is not free to make it up as he goes. He is responsible to bring a message that reflects adequately and completely and sometimes exactly the policy of those that he represents. I don't get to play fast and loose with the gospel. I get to tell the story. The story that saves. The story that transforms. The story that brings life from death. I'm satisfied with that. I want to be a reconciliation agent in my world. Not so that I can have more comfortable relationships, although it's tempting, but so those that God left me here to speak to can have a relationship with Him. That's what's important. Turn to 12, page 1205, and we'll finish with this. And I, I thank you for your patience. This is Peter. You know I find ways to get back to Peter so often. Peter chapter 3. And verse 8. Finally, all of you, addressing the saints, have unity of mind, sympathy. Older versions call that compassion. Sympathy is good too. Brotherly love, a tender heart. That means you've got to open, be open to being hurt. Did you know that? Those who guard their hearts cannot fully do the work of the gospel. You've got to take some chances to serve God. A humble mind. Oh yeah, that's what I'm signing up for, Lord. I want to be humble. <laughs> oh. He's been teaching me that lesson for years, and it's a hard one to learn. And just when you think you got it, oh yeah. boy, did you miss it. <laughs> Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were what? Called. It's not an option, by the way, that you may obtain a blessing. And we're back to where we started from. If we make a lifestyle out of presenting ourselves in the world, Who, as those who desire unity, who have compassion and love, who are tender-hearted, a humble mind, one translation said good manners, I like that. We are so lacking in manners these days. That you bless and you don't curse. Whoever desires, verse 10, to love life and seek good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and what? Pursue it. 
When was the last time that was on your daily to-do list? Seek peace. You might not want to put that on your grocery list, but if you do keep any kind of journal, whether a worship journal or anything, or a prayer journal in particular, I suggest that belongs there. Lord, let me be an instrument of your peace. And I wish I had that whole thing memorized because it would make a great finish. <laughs> Our job is to call the world to reconciliation because God has reconciled us for himself. And there's no better reason than that to join in what he's doing. What has benefited us, we ought to desire to see benefit others. Amen? Amen. We're going to sing uh, this final hymn as both a hymn and a prayer of closing, so there won't be an actual benediction. Carolyn will play a verse past when we're done. And then we'll be done. 781.